Now, I want to show you, I want to take a look at this balance sheet. And I want to go through each account. And I want to prove that the, let's see, let me, I, I want to prove that the change in every balance sheet account is somewhere represented on the cash flow statement. You with me? Okay. Let's go line by line. Is the change in cash represented over here somewhere? Well, yeah, it's down here in green, right? Okay. What about this change in accounts receivable? Does that show up somewhere on the cash flow statement? Right here, doesn't it? You with me? See what we're doing? What about the change in inventory? What is that change? It looks like it's... Um, yeah, it's right here. Is that correct? All right. What about this change in long-term investment? It went from 9000 to zero. Is that long-term investment decreased shown? Yeah, right here is what we were just talking about, right? Now do you see why when we were doing that operating cash flow uh, calculation sheet, why we did not analyze changes in non-current assets and in non-current liabilities? Because we were going to handle those down in the investing and financing sections, not the operating section which we were working on at that time. Does that make sense? Okay. So we weren't ignoring those entirely. We were just going to say, we'll deal with those when we get to the investing and financing section. And at that time, we were working on operating. Okay? What about this change in plants of, and equipment of 12500 that increase? Is that represented somewhere on the cash flow statement? It's under investing. Right there. Okay? All right. What about this accumulated depreciation? Now, how much did accumulated depreciation? Change by? Uh, increased by 4000 It increased by 4000 Okay? All right. Let's see if I can do this real quick. Um, watch how quick I can make a T account. Okay? Be amazed at my Excel skills. Okay? Okay, there is a T account. Can you see that? Let's do a T account for accumulated depreciation. Okay? Now, what type of account is accumulated depreciation? It's a contra asset, right? So is it a normal debit or credit balance account? It's a credit balance account. What's the beginning balance of accumulated depreciation? In this example, it's 46800 right? And what is the ending balance? 50,800. Is that correct? Okay. Now, when do we credit accumulated depreciation? What sort of, what sort of transaction causes us to credit accumulated depreciation? Whenever we depreciate, depreciation expense, right? Because it isn't the entry when we depreciate, we debit depreciation expense and credit accumulated depreciation? Okay. All right, how much was depreciation expense? 4000 4, Okay, it tells us right down here, right? Okay, now is there any time, do we ever debit accumulated depreciation? Do we ever debit it? Does it just keep getting larger and larger and larger and larger and larger? No, matter of fact, we did an entry a little while ago. Remember this entry that we did? Remember we debited accumulated depreciation there, right? So when do you, when do you debit accumulated depreciation? When you dispose of a, of a plant asset. Okay. Now, I think New Warnick said specifically, if you go to the bottom, we did not dispose of plant and equipment. Is that correct? So we know that this amount is zero. They told us. Okay. I'll write that. Disposal of assets, uh, of fixed assets, okay? Now, 
I think somebody asked me this in a previous class, but they would say, do you take depreciation expense off of the income statement down there, or do you analyze the change in the accumulated depreciation? And my answer is always take it off the income statement. Always take it off the income statement. And it's usually always a line item on the income statement. And somebody might say, well, it doesn't really matter because it's, it's 4,000 here and it's 4,000 here. There's a 4,000 change here. Well, yes, in this specific example, they basically told us that this was zero, right? And so, yes, the entire change was due to depreciation expense. But can you see where, let's say they didn't tell us these things. We knew the beginning balance. We knew the ending balance. But we didn't know depreciation expense, and we didn't know if they sold any assets. We can't solve for either one of those. We have two unknowns at that point, don't we? You can't do an algebra equation when there are two unknowns. Now, looking back at that T account, if they tell us that we didn't dispose of any equipment, then we know that that's zero. And yes, we can say, okay, that is $4,000. But in short, always pull the depreciation expense off of the income statement. Because there's more going on in the accumulated depreciation account sometimes than just depreciation. Are you with me? Not in this case there wasn't, but in instances where they sell equipment. Make sense? All right, but back to our original question. Is this change in accumulated depreciation somewhere represented on here? Yes. In this case, like I said, it was the entirely the depreciation expense, which shows up there. What about this change in accounts payable? Is that represented somewhere on here? Where? Right here, isn't it? What about changes in wages payable? Right there, isn't it? Okay. What about changes in common stock? It looks like common stock, which is an equity account, went up by 8,000. Is that somewhere represented on the cash flow statement? Right here. Correct? All right, there's only one other account, retained earnings. And my question is, is that account represented somewhere on here? And the answer, of course, is going to be yes. Now, coming off that, I always joke in my accounting two class that retained earnings is, is, an, is the account that has an inferiority complex. Because I always introduce it, explain what it is, explain what it does, and then a week later we'll go to it and people act like they've never heard of retained earnings before and they can't tell me anything about it. It's like a friend that you have to reintroduce at a party. What is retained earnings? What can you guys tell me about retained earnings? It's like a capital account. Retained earnings is like the capital account. Sole proprietorship partnership has the capital account. Corporations have the retained earnings account. That being said, it is an equity account, isn't it? Retained earnings is an equity account with a credit balance. How does retained earnings increase? Credit. It, it, it increases the credit, but the net income increases it, right? Yeah. Doesn't the net income increase capital? If you look at your statement of equity for a partnership or a sole proprietorship, well, on a statement of retained earnings, a net income is what increases retained earnings. Go back to sole proprietorship and partnership. Remember how owners withdrawals decreased capital? Okay, well, retained earnings for a corporation, we don't call them withdrawals all the time. What do we call, sometimes call when money leaves the company and goes to the owners in a corporation? Dividends. Dividends. You with me? So let's go back to... Let's modify this T account over here, okay? We'll delete that all out. And now let's change this to retained earnings. Okay, retained earnings is a credit balance account. What was the beginning balance? 38,600. 38, uh, the ending balance is 41,600. 41, okay. Do we know what the net income amount was? Yeah, we know it was what, 10,500? Correct? Yeah. So that would credit or increase retained earnings, right? 
And what'd you say decreased retained earnings? What item? Dividends. Dividends. Okay. Dividends were how much? Do we know? 7,500. 7, okay. Well, does that number plus this number minus this number equal that number? It does. I can do that in my head, right? 38,600 plus 10,500 minus 7,500 does equal 41,600. So then my next question is, are these items represented somewhere on the cash flow statement? If they are, then we have accounted for this change in retained earnings on the cash flow statement. Are these items on the cash flow statement? Yeah, dividends is down here. Net income is up here. You with me? So in short, let me ask you a question. Is every change in every balance sheet account somehow represented on this cash flow statement? Yes. The answer is yes. And you say, well, why do we care about that? Well, let me tell you why we care about it. I'll go in and do consulting for a company. And a lot of times they have never done a cash flow statement. And so I'll have to do the first ever cash flow statement. And I know, what it ha I know the answer to it, right? Well, if I can't get it to work out, I can't get it to reconcile to what I know the change in cash is, one of the things I do is I go through their balance sheet and I ask myself for every account, have I shown the change in this account somewhere on the cash flow statement? Are you with me? And a lot of times I'll find some weird account like a, um, a copyright. So an intangible asset, and I'll go, there you go. The intangible account, the intangible asset account changed, and I don't have that represented anywhere on the cash flow statement. And so I'll go put that in, and yep, that was it. But do you see what I'm saying? I can go through every account on the balance sheet and ask myself, have I accounted for that specific change? Not just have I, have I mentioned that account somewhere, I'm saying I've accounted for that specific dollar change between the beginning and the ending amount. Does that make sense? Okay. Questions on that? Any questions you guys getting that? Feel better about these than you did a week ago? Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to give you two more cash flow statements to do. Okay. One of them is called the Rosenau Corporation. Okay. One of them is called the Rosenau Corporation. And this is a pretty simple one. Okay. This is probably a simpler one than any of them that you've done. Okay. <laughs> Good, I hear. Okay. Um, but I want you to do that one. And then the other one I'm going to give you, I hope I brought it, is, yes, don't worry, I have it. Whew, thought I'd forgot it. The other one I'm going to give you is called Foxborough. Okay? Now, sometimes this one freaks people out because there are six other items that you need to classify and put into the cash flow statement. Okay? Now let me give you one hint though. Um, down here it says we sold equipment and then later on we purchased some equipment. Can that happen in the same year? Sure it can. You can sell one truck and buy another one, right? You can sell a piece, you know, you can, yeah, you buy and sell stuff all the time, right? Okay, coming off of that, if you purchase some equipment during the year, but you also sell some equipment, you're not going to combine those into some sort of net purchase or net sale. You're going to have an investing activity called purchased equipment and an investing activity called sold some equipment. Does that make sense? Okay, so don't let this one freak you out, going back to it. Just classify each one of these. And if you don't know what number to put on the cash flow statement, ask yourself, how is cash affected? Okay? 
how was cash affected? Okay. For example, if we sold the equipment for $26,000 cash, by golly, in the investing section, it's going to say plus $26,000. It doesn't matter what the original cost or book value or any of that is. You're always looking at how much cash came in or went out when you do the cash flow statement. Are you with me? So, for the next time, I want you to do those two cash flow statements. I want you to do the Rosenau one and the Foxborough one. And then next session, what we're going to do is we'll go over the answers to those. And then we're going to interpret these a little bit. Now that we know how to do these a little bit, let's talk about interpretation of them. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right, you guys are doing great. Do those two cash flow statements. We'll see you next time. Okay? Bye-bye.